Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me so much pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of India Habitat Center and Professor Benoy K. Behar. How does one speak of an art historian who is a respected speaker at a breathtakingly long list of prestigious universities and museums around the world, yet art history is only one part of his life's mission. He's a filmmaker who has made over 146 deeply researched documentary films. He's an eminent photographer, Buddhist scholar, and a record-setting traveler. He is the author of some of the best-selling books on Indian art history in the world. As a labor of love, Professor Behel has traveled to all corners of this vast subcontinent, documenting even remote temples and sites, not just once, but several times. The result is a breathtaking documentation of culture, which provides a new perspective to Indian and Asian art and culture. Ladies and gentlemen, Benoy K. Behel speaks to us today on the ancient city of Kanchipuram. Thank you for your attention. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to be with uh, all of you again to uh, share another chapter out of the uh, cultural history of this uh, subcontinent. My many thanks to India Habitat Center for uh, creating these opportunities for us to uh, for us to share these wonderful moments of culture across indian history my many thanks also to doordarshan who have played uh, so well a role as a public broadcaster over the years doordarshan have consistently uh, sponsored the making of uh, my deeply researched films on very serious subjects of art history. I think that's remarkable in this uh, commercial world of today and I remain always uh, grateful to them. My thanks to uh, Sujata Chatterjee who helps me in all that I do and makes my work uh, possible. Ladies and gentlemen, it was the fourth century BCE. Megasthenes was ambassador, the Greek ambassador in the court of uh, Emperor Chandragupta Maurya. And he was writing home about uh, wool, which he had seen growing on bushes. Now, obviously before he came to India, Megasthenes had not seen uh, cotton growing on uh, bushes. So he was calling it wool. We are reminded of the fact that uh, India is one of the very earliest of places to grow fine cotton. And uh, it had an immense role to play in the cultural development and in the history of India. This cotton, which was grown chiefly across the Deccan, from the Western Deccan, Maharashtra and Karnataka, across to the Eastern Deccan, uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, cotton was uh, very widely grown. And this led to the making of uh, very fine uh, textiles. The textiles attracted traders from across the world. In fact, uh, we have early accounts, Pliny the Elder, for instance, writing in Rome in the first century that Roman coffers are being emptied for buying too many fine textiles from India and so many other records stating practically exactly the same thing. So what did we have? We had prosperity. We had a culture where uh, people from across the world, Greeks, Romans, people from Southeast Asia, Arabs, so many others were rubbing shoulders with each other in peninsular India. 
the, uh, the breezes of many lands and cultures were freely found in peninsula India. And there was prosperity. There was, in fact, the development of a great urban culture, an urban and urbane culture, a sophisticated culture, which we see represented in uh, the early art of India, especially across the Deccan, from Maharashtra till the uh, eastern uh, Deccan. And uh, we see the development of uh, great centers of learning, great cities, remarkable among which is the city of uh, Kanchipuram. Kanchipuram from very early times was uh, a place known for the, for the making of the finest of textiles, cotton textiles. It is also one of the greatest of centers of uh, Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism. Some of the best known teachers of Buddhism from India, uh, Bodhidharma, who spread uh, Buddhism and founded uh, the uh, Chan Buddhism in uh, China, which became uh, Zen Buddhism in Japan, was from Kanchipuram. Bodhisena was invited by the uh, Japanese emperor to come and uh, inaugurate the 8th century uh, Todaiji temple at Nara was from Kanchipuram. What an amazing place Kanchipuram was, very close to uh, the port of uh, Mamlapuram and a port in its own right as ships came up the river to Kanchipuram itself. What a marvelous time, what a marvelous place. And such development of ideas, such prosperity which led to the development of ideas, which gave time and uh, such great development of culture. Uh, in the last uh, screening one month ago, we saw uh, Mamalapura, the great uh, port. And now we come to the imperial city from where the Pallava king ruled, Kanchipura. And you see the great uh, temple which uh, Narasimha Varman II built here. It gives me pleasure to share this film with you. And I would request uh, Sushant to please uh, run the film. Thank you. One of the greatest historical cities of India was Kanchipuram. It was close to the busy port of Mamalapuram and was the capital city of many kings over the centuries. Kanchipuram is one of the seven most holy cities for Hindus in India. It is mentioned by the Sanskrit poet Kalidasa of the 5th century as one of the greatest cities in the country. It was visited in the 7th century by the Chinese pilgrim scholar Xuanzang. Many famous Buddhist philosophers and thinkers were born here, including Bodhidharma, who introduced Zen Buddhism in China at the Shualin Temple in the 6th century. The Pala River actually comes from Andhra and it goes through Kanchipuram till it meets the sea at Mamalapuram. So ships would dock at Mamalapuram and then many of them could come up, the smaller ones definitely could have come up all the way to Kanchipuram since it is also referred to as being on the river. Of course the Pala today has silted up. We have Roman 
amphorae. We found Roman coins. So we know the Romans did trade with this area. Definitely Southeast Asia because if the ships went out there and Pallava Grantha is still used in many of the uh, scripts of Southeast Asia, Cambodian for example, is still written in Pallava Grantha. So uh, they definitely would have come here too because this region was a kind of a re-trading center. You know, a lot of spices came from Southeast Asia. The Romans came and bought the spices. The Romans came and bought cotton because Kanchipuram was a major cotton weaving center. Silk comes much later. Of course, um, uh, Roman mm, coin paintings and Roman uh, and Faro and other things paintings are not new to uh, this, uh, what you call uh, Tamil country, especially in the East Coast. In fact, this, uh, when uh, Wheeler, Mortimer Wheeler excavated Sarika made in 1946, uh, that was um, taken as one of the extensive um, Roman uh, contact place or Roman trade place or Roman commercial place in India, that is, which was comparable so, um, uh, with any other great site of, in, the, in the entire world. So we are finding so, these hundreds of uh, Roman gold coins uh, in hoards. Interestingly, we know that around about 50 or 58 AD, there was a resolution in the Roman uh, um, uh, rather parliament that uh, uh, the government, that means uh, the king should not, the emperor should not waste money or rather the gold just for the luxury of getting the um, materials from India. Kanchipuram was one of the greatest centers for the study of Sanskrit, Pali and Tamil. Today, it is known as a city of a thousand temples. It is also famous for the wonderful silk sarees which are produced here. Kanchi was probably chosen as the capital by the Pallavas because it was a center of cotton weaving. Now, cotton has been the biggest trade item in ancient South India, Tamil Nadu. Somewhere along this period, the mulberry tree was introduced and in literature it's mentioned that it came from Sinnam, that is China. The introduction of silk from China, which is important because it means that there was a continuous trade with China. And I think that's something we should remember. Don't forget Hyun Sang has come all the way down to Kanchipuram in the 7th century and written about it and written about the stupa, Ashokan stupa that he saw and so on. So obviously Chinese were coming all this way because it's interesting that it was the 7th century when both sugar, which is called chini, and uh, silk, which is called chinnam or sinnam, came from China. The cotton, of course, came from further north, from the Deccan, was brought here and the weavers developed this very fine art of weaving the Kanchipuram cotton sari. The Pallava king Narsimha Varman II, also known as Rajasimha, ruled in the first quarter of the 8th century. He made the first structural temple in Tamil Nadu on the shores of the port town of Mamalapuram. Seventy kilometers away from Mamalapuram is the city of Kanchipuram. King Rajasimha made the glorious Kailashnatha temple here for his personal worship. A foundation inscription states that he erected this great house of Shiva to reflect his own glory and the laughter of the Lord. The temple is dedicated to Shiva Gangadhara, the bearer of the river Ganga. The Shore Temple on the Bay of Bengal is really quite a simple uh, event. It's two very small linga sanctuaries placed slightly at a diagonal, each with a towered pyramid rising above. But it's not a very clearly planned, I would say, monument. Nonetheless, it's extremely beautiful and delicately modelled. But the moment we go to Kanchipuram, now we're into the, well into the 8th century, with Raja Simha, the most important king at that time, we see with a Kailasnath temple there, a very well-planned monument. It is contained in a rectangle of walls, 
and the walls have little tiny little shrines set into them and in the middle of the paved compound is the main temple itself. This consists of a linga sanctuary with a tower, a pyramidal tower above and the sides of the sanctuary have these deep niches, they're almost like shrines in themselves in which different aspects of Shiva are portrayed. The problem with this temple is that it was built not in granite but in a type of sandstone that was not very strong. So many of the sculptures have become very poorly worn and they were on many occasions covered with plaster. The plaster has now been taken off and now we can appreciate better some of the original types of sculptural devices. The temple's foundation inscription likens the ruler's descent from King Parmeshwara with that of Skanda from Lord Shiva. The deity in the temple and by implication the temple itself was named Rajasimha Pallaveshwara or the Lord of Rajasimha Pallava. This practice was to become popular in all later South Indian temples. The temple also has the name Kailash Natha or Shiva the Lord of Mount Kailasha. Just inside the main entrance on the east is a smaller shrine built by the king's son Mahindra Varman III. Unlike the main shrine, this has a barrel-shaped roof. There is a row of smaller shrines in front of the temple. Inscriptions show that at least two of them were made by queens. A mandapa with a nandi inside stands at a considerable distance from the temple. The entire complex of this royal temple is grand and lavishly sculpted. Rampant lions, a royal symbol of the Pallavas, are made everywhere. They display the vigour and courage of the spirit within us to fight the demons of our ignorance. They also display the glory of the Pallava king who made the temple. As the worshipper moves on the outer ambulatory path, shrines are made here. These prepare him and begin the journey, the transport of delight, away from the confusions and anxieties of the material world. The shrines made in the outer walls of the sanctum house large images of Shiva. These are among the finest and most elegant ever made in India. We see images of Shiva's cosmic dance, the Tandava. This was a favourite theme with Raja Simha. The dynamism of the dance is expressed in the many arms of Shiva which move around him. The bent knees express the power of his rhythmic leap upwards. Besides the Shiva Linga, the shrines of the temple have the image of Somaskanda. In Rajasimha's time, this icon was constantly made in the sanctums of temples. The Soma Skanda shows Shiva with Parvati as Uma and their son Skanda or Kartikeya. The Lord and his spouse are presented as universal parents. A parallel is drawn between the divine family and that of the king. The sculpted figures on the temple walls breathe with the inspired workmanship of the artist. A shrine portrays Shiva as the enchanting mendicant. Around him are the enamoured wives of rishis. We see Shiva as Tripurantaka when he destroys the forts of the demons. This was an icon which was to become very popular with the Cholas who succeeded the Pallavas in this region. Durga as Mahisha Sur Mardani 
is one of the most expressive images of Indian art. Durga personifies the energy and power within us to face and to destroy the demon of our ignorance. The grace with which she is made complements her vigor and the dynamic theme of the composition. The mandapa or hall of the temple was originally a detached structure and is today connected by a 16th century construction. The enclosing wall of the temple complex has a series of small cells which face east and west. The outer niches have sculpted images of deities. Deep within the inner niches are paintings of Lord Shiva in his various forms. These are valuable as they are among the very few remains of the beautiful paintings of Pallava times. It is in these niches that some exquisite paintings of the 7th century still survive. These are among the earliest paintings of the Hindu tradition to be found anywhere in India. With the royal patronage of Pallava temples, here we see a change in the style of Indian painting. Whereas ancient paintings had focused entirely upon a simplicity and sense of grace, here for the first time we begin to see a sense of royal grandeur which comes into the art. Fragments of paint on the sculptures reveal that they would once all have been covered with a layer of plaster and painted. There is a panel of ganas, only 30 inches in height, which runs along the base of the temple. It displays the high quality of carving everywhere in the temple. Ganas are an important motif in Shiva temples and they depict the joyous spirit of the worship of the Lord. This gorgeously sculpted temple presents the essential features of the style of South Indian temples which were to follow. The early Western Chalukyan king Vikramaditya II ruled in Karnataka in the second quarter of the 8th century. He had vowed to destroy the Kailashnatha temple at Kanchipuram to avenge the earlier defeat of the Chalukyans when Vatapi, their capital, was sacked. However, when he did capture Kanchipuram, he was so overwhelmed by the beauty of this temple that he left it untouched. In fact, it is quite likely that later Chalukyan monuments, such as the Virupaksh temple at Patadakal, were largely influenced by the style of this temple. The Vaikuntha Perumal temple, dedicated to Vishnu, was made at Kanchipuram in the second half of the 8th century by King Nandivarman II. The Vimana or Tar is taller than that of the Kailashnatha temple. The enclosure wall of the temple has on its inside a pillared gallery with sculpted reliefs. Some of these have labels and depict the history and glory of the Pallavas the first such historical account of kings in Indian art. What is so interesting about this temple, it consists of three sanctuaries, one superimposed on the other, for seated, standing and reclining Vishnu. Only the priests had access to these sanctuaries. Um, royal worshippers probably didn't proceed beyond the lowest sanctuary. Near Kanchipuram is the township now called Chinna Kanchipuram, which means Little Kanchipuram. In the old days, this may have been Jaina 
Kanchipuram, which has become Chinna Kanchipuram now, for the Vaishnav and Jaina establishments would have been here, while the Shavite and Buddhist establishments were in the main city of Kanchipuram today. Indeed, Kanchipuram was also a great center of Jaina learning in ancient times. I think a lot of civilization, South Indian civilization, has started in this area because uh, in Kanchipuram, we know that Ashoka had built a stupa over here. And the fact that so many people came from different parts of the world to trade means that there was a booming economy. And interestingly, although the Palar has gone, if you take the ancient route of the Palar, which can still be seen from uh, the uh, geological survey maps. You can see the old course of the Pala River and along that old course are so many Pallava temples. So that means the entire region between Mamalapuram and Kanchipuram was a very well settled area. One thing very important in this area is that agriculture really took off. The Pallavas also built um, I don't know how many tanks, artificial irrigation tanks, and I know that about 93 of them were all interconnected, so that the overflow from one went to another. Adi Shankara also established mathas all over India. The four main ones are Badri, Dwarka, Peet, uh, Jagannath Puri, and Shringeri. But then he ma made a Peetam in Kanchipuram and after his time there has been a uh, continuity of Shankaracharyas who have had a very major role in the history of the development of Hinduism in this region. Also belonging to Kanchipuram was another very great saint Ramanuja of the Vaishnavas. The exquisite uh, Kailash Natha temple of Kanchipuram marks a, a transition point in uh, Indian history and Indian history of art. This is a time when uh, royal patronage has uh, come in to the making of uh, temples and art. We saw its beginnings, the beginnings of this royal patronage for the first time taking place at uh, Mamalapuram. And now we see it consolidated here in uh, Kanchipuram. This brings with it a sophistication, a courtly culture can be seen behind uh, the shaping of this art and its uh, manner. At the same time, the artistic traditions, the grace, the natural grace, of ancient Indian art is still alive in the hands of the artists, the sculptors. So it is a very beautiful period. And it is indeed a period of uh, transition. From here onwards, we will see uh, the royal uh, participation in what happens at temples and art and how they are shaped. We will see this royal patronage growing more and more. And gradually we will see that uh, the uh, art will become uh, wooden. It will not be that finest of art that came from ancient times. 
but uh, the Kailash Natha Kanchipur temple, this exquisite temple, this jewel box, presents a wonderful uh, period of transition and uh, sheer beauty in itself. I will be very happy to uh, answer a few questions if you have them, and I will request uh, Sujata Chatterjee to please uh, read them out from the, uh, from the chat box. Thank you. And I must, uh, I must thank uh, Sushant for another uh, excellent screening. Thank you very much. While we're waiting for the questions to come, I'd take this opportunity to announce the next film that we have lined up for you. This time we are leaving India, we're traveling east, and the film that we're going to show you is called Indian Deities Worshipped in Japan. This is on the 7th of January. It's a Saturday again, and it's at 6 p.m. So please mark your calendars, and we'd love for you to be here with us. There's a comment saying, thank you so much, informative indeed. It's very beautiful looking at uh, the, uh, the art and culture and uh, cities of uh, Peninsula India. It's indeed a, a very uh, remarkable chapter in the history of the world. Uh, this was, uh, this area was uh, among the most cosmopolitan of all uh, places in the world. The fine textiles were being made here. The finest of textiles were being made here at a time where, when in some other places, people may still have been in animal skins. Very sophisticated thought processes, sophisticated processes of philosophy, Sophisticated art was uh, developing and had developed at the very early period. And uh, the reach was immense. The contact with the whole world was immense. The, uh, there was the exchange of ideas, which was immense with so many parts of the world. In fact, uh, the ancient world has much to teach us we sometimes feel that uh, modern times is when uh, interactions between uh, people and countries and faraway places has become common. But it's quite amazing to see the fruitful interaction of ancient times. And what we see here also is an interaction with the openness, an interaction with the gentleness, an interaction with the warm acceptance of ideas. And uh, truly, a very sophisticated and wonderful culture. There's a comment from Philip Martinez saying, saying very instructive indeed. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Philip. Thank you so much. Dr. Uma Shankar, how well is the Kailash Natha temple being preserved? Is it open to common people to see the innermost sculptures on the walls? I believe so. Till the last that I was there, uh, the sculptures were uh, open to people. Of course, um, the sand, sandstone has eroded. And in fact, in, uh, in British times, uh, plaster was uh, put again uh, on much of the sculpture in order to uh, preserve it. And that sculpture, the, that plaster, uh, is rather crude and did hide uh, the beauty of uh, the uh, sculpture. But uh, while I say this, I'm also reminded of the fact that some original uh, bits of uh, plaster on the sculpture have also uh, survived. And these original bits of plaster remind us that Indian sculpture was uh, generally always covered with plaster and painted, something which we sometimes uh, forget about these days because we have got used to seeing Indian sculpture without the plaster and paint on it. Thank you. Deepa from the Hindu wanted to know which foreign scholars visited Kanchipuram. Well, we uh, did speak about uh, Xuan Zhang in the seventh uh, century. And uh, there would have been immense uh, amount of travel. In fact, uh, Indonesia was usually uh, 
a stepping stone, a, a halting point for the Chinese who were traveling uh, to India. And uh, the, uh, the shipping route was, uh, was much more active than we may uh, expect. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, scholars from here who were going to places like China, uh, for instance, Bodhi Dharma, uh, on his way in Southeast Asia, he, uh, he taught and became well known uh, for propagation of Buddhism in Southeast Asia. And Sujata and I have had the uh, pleasure of discovering that uh, many temples in uh, Vietnam, for instance, are dedicated to Bodhi Dharma. In fact, uh, after the Buddha, the next uh, most revered uh, deity of uh, Vietnam, Buddhist deity of Vietnam, is in fact the great Indian teacher from Kanchipuram, uh, Bodhi Dharma. So there was a great deal of uh, interaction. Uh, let us not forget that uh, the uh, Champa Kingdom of Vietnam for, uh, for more than 1200 years was a very active uh, uh, seafaring uh, culture which, which covered, uh, which ruled most of uh, Vietnam. And that would have also been an active uh, touch with uh, places like uh, Kanchipura. So the ancient world was really a place where there was considerable movement. One is reminded of the fact that uh, uh, Atisa, who, whose memory survives with us because he uh, became so important in the development of Tibetan Buddhism. Now, Atisa was a Buddhist scholar who first uh, studied at the uh, Nalanda University. He then went to complete further studies at uh, a great monastery in uh, Indonesia. And then he came back and he became a very important teacher at the Vikramshila University also in Bihar. And then of course he accepted the invitation repeatedly made to him by the Tibetans and went to teach in Tibet. So there is a, there is a movement which is taking place all the time. And the maritime routes are, uh, are very active and very busy. I wish uh, more memories of uh, the maritime trade of Peninsula India could be revived. It would be quite fascinating. Thank you. Aditya Das asking, what are some of the differences between Narasimha II and Rajasimha in terms of their approach to temple building? Uh, Narasimha Parman II is also known as uh, Rajasimha. And uh, the, uh, the uh, approach which is now seen is that uh, though in ancient times, all temples and all stupas and all the monuments of ancient India were in fact sponsored by the common people. Hundreds and hundreds of common people used to individually sponsor the making of parts of the temples and stupas. And the kings did not, uh, were not the sponsors or the patrons. Now, coming to Pallava times is the first time that uh, kings like uh, King uh, Narsimha Varman II begin to uh, patronize temples directly. So uh, that is what uh, Leads to uh, leads to a more uh, sophisticated uh, attitude in the art. The uh, names of the temples are also the shrines are dedicated, uh, and the names of the temples are according to this new form of patronage. And this change keeps on happening. By the time we reach uh, the end of the tenth century, temples become very large, very tall, announcing their presence over longer. Uh, uh, spaces, whereas uh, temples in ancient India were small. They were meant for the very personalized uh, experience where the devotee used to come to lose himself and therefore to gain the best of himself. Where the devotee used to come to be moved by very personally made, very graceful uh, sculptures and paintings 
and uh, experience uh, experience uh, the depth of his own self reflected in uh, the art now with the uh, with the uh, patronage of uh, great kings the temples begin to show more of the glory of uh, the lord and the glory of the king and this this is the, essentially the change which takes place and therefore the temples from this period onwards will start growing in height and size and grandeur and the quality of uh, inspiring awe and be less and less of the purely spiritual marvelous exquisite experiences of ancient india which in fact are rather unique in in, in the world and are exquisitely beautiful thank you navin is tanjore is is the big temple at tanjore inspired from the kailash nath temple uh, the big temple at uh, tanjavur the brahmadeshwara temple dedicated to the great lord shiva uh, is what i was referring to uh, when i said that by the end of the 10th century very tall uh, temples will get made so it, when it was made it would have been uh, one of the tallest uh, structures uh, in the world and uh, indeed it would have been uh, and still is extremely impressive at the same time the quality of the sculptures on it is comparatively wooden so that is the change which is taking place things are becoming impressive but that inherent uh, personal uh, exquisite quality of grace uh, is comparatively less when the impressiveness is more thank you dr uma shankar is the kailashnatha temple short and stout as compared to the slim and tall tanjore temple the kailashnatha temple is a uh, is very beautiful it's it's a uh, very uh, it, there's a jewel like uh, perfection in it it is a uh, definitely of a much smaller size as used to be all the uh, uh, ancient uh, temples and uh, it still carries with it the work of uh, artists who grew in the traditions of ancient india and who had uh, sheer beauty coming out of their hands who had uh, who were sharing the sheer beauty of their souls and uh, that that exquisite quality is still there and uh, in the case of uh, the tanjavur temple of course you are talking about something extremely impressive something which was meant to reflect the glory of the lord and the glory and might of uh, the king who patronized the temple thank you sonali shah sir would like to know more about jain kanchi so kanchipuram was uh, as much a great center of uh, jaina learning uh, and uh, intellectual center of jainism as much as uh, hinduism and uh, buddhism and uh, indeed uh, there is a comparatively less focus on uh, the jaina traditions there is much more attention to uh, the hindu traditions and much more attention to buddhist traditions and uh, of course we do not have uh, at kanchipuram such remarkable uh, temple such as the uh, kailashnatha temple which is a hindu temple and the uh, vaikuntha perumal temple which is a hindu temple and uh, in fact we have even less of uh, the buddhist tradition which is surviving so uh, so there is not so much that survives it is mainly the hindu tradition which uh, survives uh, in uh, many beautiful monuments at uh, kanchipuram thank you aditya das interesting to note that the ganas are also reflected in borobudur can you comment on the period of transfer oh uh, simultaneously while uh, 
temples, stupas, and art was created uh, uh, within Indian shores, it was also seen in the uh, places of uh, Indic uh, influence. So it, it is not that it took a long time for the, uh, for the artistic traditions to spread. It's, it's simultaneously seen in different places. And uh, then the Borobudur Stupa is one of those uh, absolutely beautiful uh, reflections of, uh, of uh, the Indic traditions of art, which there is. Thank you very much. And may I mention that uh, Ganas, Ganas that, uh, Ganas that uh, depict the human soul, Ganas that depict that which is within us, Ganas which is the, uh, which relate to human aspirations and, and human joy and uh, the human uh, devotion to the divine are among the very beautiful uh, aspects of uh, Indian art. Thank you. Prasad Karyavasam, can Sri Benoit talk about the Buddhist heritage of Kanchipuram? Thank you for your question, Prasad. Good to have you with us. And uh, well, the most remarkable examples of uh, the Buddhist uh, culture are the great uh, teachers uh, such as uh, Bodhi Dharma and Bodhi Sena, and the fact that uh, Kanchipuram was uh, important enough for the uh, Buddhist uh, pilgrim scholar uh, uh, Xuan to come here and to talk about it, talk about its importance. Uh, like I said, the uh, uh, the, origin, the temples of those times, Buddhist, uh, etc., uh, are not available to us today. Thank you. Deepa from the Hindu, you spoke about interaction between Romans and those living in Kanchipuram. What kind of exchange have we seen? Can we find anything apart from Roman coins? The uh, main uh, remnants of uh, Roman uh, uh, trade and uh, Roman uh, colonies in Peninsula India, whether it is uh, Kanchipura or whether it is Mamalapura or whether it is uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, where you have the Amravati Stupa, etc. The main remnants are uh, large hordes of uh, coins, Roman coins. And uh, there is mention of, uh, mention of uh, Indian textiles which were being traded in uh, Roman writings. So these are the main two things which uh, we, uh, from where we learn about uh, the Roman interactions. It's uh, also possible that uh, there are bloodlines which flow providing uh, uh, various uh, uh, different uh, DNA to people in, uh, in, in Peninsula India, which uh, come from uh, very early times and uh, the time when the Romans were there, etc. Thank you. Did cotton go to Egypt from India? Did chini sugar come from China, come from Chin? Egypt is one of the earliest uh, growers of cotton too. So uh, one would imagine that uh, simultaneously, cotton, very fine cotton, was being grown in uh, Egypt as well as in India. So internationally, maybe the Egyptian cotton has been. Uh, better known and we have not been uh, speaking so much about uh, the Indian cotton trade. But we should speak about it because uh, much of uh, the, much of culture is based upon such uh, trade and such prosperity also which come from this trade and, and also the, the providing of uh, 
the providing of uh, fine means of livelihood, a very artistic means of livelihood, in weaving wonderful textiles. And it's a very inherent part of culture. So cotton has uh, played a very important role in this. And uh, yes, I believe that uh, uh, sugar uh, may have been introduced uh, by the Chinese. Thank you. Aditya Das, there is almost a Gandhara influence. Is this real or am I imagining it? Especially with the dynamic sculpture of Shiva at the Kailash Natha temple. Thanks for a superb presentation and analysis as always. Thank you very much. Um, Gandhara presents us, uh, presents us a different realm. Uh, Indian art is very idealistic and uh, it does not uh, attempt to be uh, uh, it does not attempt to be realistic. Gandhara art uh, on the other hand uh, relies more upon uh, Greek and uh, Central Asian traditions and is not uh, is, is, is not so much doesn't consist so much of idealized form. It tries to present us more of life in the world as it is represented in the art. So that is a, that is a very clear uh, distinction. And uh, the, uh, the Shiva that we are speaking about here at uh, Kanchipuram is uh, one of the finest expressions of this subtle and very idealized and very uh, beautiful forms of uh, Indian art. Thank you. There's a comment from Dr. Uma Shankar. Wonderful presentation and a lovely film to project a beautiful heritage at Kanchi. Looking forward to your January 7th presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to having you, uh, all of you with us again. And uh, it's been a great pleasure. My many thanks again to India Habitat Center. Thank you.